Well, surprise, surprise. Shane is out of town, I don't know where, but uh, last week Reggie came up and says, I'm going to need you next week. And when Reggie says, I'm going to need you next week, guess what? I'm here. <laughs> oh, Reggie, good job. You know what, I've already heard two preachers this morning, maybe three, you know, that uh, Eli, you did a fantastic job as usual. Great voice. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking we've got some we got some opportunity here. And Steve, we always got we got opportunity. And Steve over there as a preacher, don't we, Mike Mika? You know we could do that. We can draft them. That's the way this thing works. It happened to me some 50 years ago. It can happen to you. You know. But I look out this morning, and I know we got people at home that are, are watching. Uh, especially, you know, Ken and Joe are. Ken's out of the hospital. He got one stent uh, last week in his heart and uh, sounded really good Friday when I talked to him. Uh, and I, I look out and I don't see Rich and Marcy. You know, so let's always keep our, our folks at home in our prayers. And I do look out this morning and I see a young man with an orange tee on his shirt. And in just a few, few hours, he's heading off to serve our country. So. Tucker, this morning, our heart and our prayers go with you and your family, because I know a mom and dad are going to be praying awfully hard for you. And there's so many things going on this morning. I look out and I know, uh, I won't use names, we've got people that are suffering with cancer. They're suffering with things going on in their life. You know, talk to Randy, he's, he's had MS for many years, and he's got a smile on every time he comes through the door. You know, we've got all got things on our hearts this morning. We need a revival, and we're going to talk about that this morning. So as we uh, begin this uh, program, this sermon, or whatever I'm going to do, let's go to our Father in prayer. Father, we're, we're praying for a revival. We're praying for a newness. We're praying for healing. We're praying for the courage to go on and face another day. Help us to be restored in our physical health and our spiritual health, whatever we're struggling with, with our families, with our jobs, with our country, with politics, and just everything that's going on around our world. How frightening it can be at times, but we know you are greater than our fears. You're the creator of the universe, the sustainer of the universe, and your word says, God so loved the world that he gave us his son that we might not perish but have everlasting life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. How in the world do you uh, think about a sermon when somebody asks you, you're going to preach next week? Well, I thought of it as uh, finished up Grant's class last week and uh, listening to Shane, who will be back and pick up in James next week as we talk about uh, this book of faith that James uh, is on and telling us how to have a living faith. And I thought, uh, I sat there listening to Grant about Cane Ridge. Cool place, isn't it, uh, Grant? Uh, and a lot of things happened there. And one of my heroes of the faith, Barton W. Stone, some people love him, some people don't. But he had the courage to say, you know, we've got the same Bible, we, we love the same God, we do some of the same things, why don't we worship together? And I had that opportunity, Mary Dell and I went to the Cane Ridge Restoration Workshop a number of decades ago, and it was one of my cousins, or two of my cousins were elders at the church that sponsored it, and we in, enjoyed doing that and listening to some of the comments about the restoration movement. And then we went to Cane Ridge itself, and I stood in the pulpit where Barton W. Stone had preached, and I thought, what in the world were they thinking? You know, during that time, 1803, 1804, they remembered the Revolutionary War. Can you imagine what was going through your mind as this war ended and you gained your freedom from England? But then you had to conquer the wilderness. You had to face uh, the natives who weren't too happy about you being here. And uh, that was a story in itself, how you had to fight your way to, to conquer a new world. And uh, countries are born in turmoil. Countries are born in war. Countries are sustained through war and by warriors. 
And we need to remember that as we go into the independence uh, era, July the 4th. This isn't just about parades and picnics. It's about men and women who have served their country and have lived for an ideal that we need to be free. And as we think about that, and, we, and Eli did a great job reading from Psalms 119, the longest psalm in the Bible. I thought we were going to read the whole thing, Eli. You know, it's only 100 or so more scriptures out there to read. It would take an hour or two, but we'll, we'll make it. No, it's pretty good. But it is the longest chapter in the Bible, and it is filled with words like revive me, deliver me, restore me, help me. So the writer is, uh, he's calling to God. It's a poem. It's an acrostic. Each uh, stanza begins with the letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And it is filled with requests made to God. And we're going to cover that. So when I think about revive me, O Lord, or deliver me, uh, you know, I, I go back to some of those words, and if I can find my notes, I think I copied them. Uh, yeah, this is from the American Standard Version, a little bit, a little bit different. Consider my affliction and deliver me, for I do not forget thy law. Plead for my cause and redeem me. Quicken me according to thy word. Salvation is far from the wicked, for they seek not thy statues. Great are thy tender mercies, O Jehovah. Quicken me according to thine ordinances. Many are my persecutors and my adversaries, yet I have not swerved from my testimonies. I beheld the treacherous and was grieved. And you read it in other versions, he said, oh, it just made me sick, is what he basically said. I've seen what the, uh, those who oppose you have done, and it just makes me sick. It's like hearing the nightly news. And uh, because they observe not thy word, consider how I love thy precepts. Quicken me, O Jehovah, according to thy loving kindness. The sum of thy word is truth. This weekend, I heard a lot about revival and renewal. There are two things that happened in St. Louis this weekend you probably didn't hear about on the evening news. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, the St. Louis Pen Show was in town. And if you're a pen aficionado, that means like fountain pens and all that, and there are hundreds of people that gathered at uh, Sheraton Westport to look at pens and buy stuff and get ink and paper and talk about how to fix them. And a friend of mine from years ago, salesman for a 3M company, was there, and he clutched in his hand three pens that had been his mother's. And he says, I know they're not worth much, but they were my mother's. I want to restore them so I can use them. And so he took them to one of the vendors that cleaned them, fixed the nibs that you write with, helped to restore them to a working condition. And he was so happy. He was waiting for, he had been there for hours and waiting for the third one to be finally repaired. So the St. Louis Pen Show was more than just pens. It was about things that are important to us. And I have my mother's pen. I restored it. I cleaned it. I filled it. I used it. Just like my mother did in 1933. Our faith is a lot like that, isn't it? We need to restore our faith. We need to, we need to clean it. We need to fill it. We need to use it. You see, you probably have got some old fountain pens or pens sitting in a drawer at home that don't get used. And they'll never be usable again unless you restore them. But in your life, maybe that's the way your faith is. Maybe there's something we need to do there to, to do something about it. Well, Saturday rolled around. There's another event 
that took place uh, downtown St. Louis. It's called the uh, Tropical and Succulent Plant Show. I bet you never heard of that either, did you? But our, our oldest granddaughter loves plants, loves plants and animals. You know, she's a horse girl too. She's an equestrian. She goes to the holistic horsemanship, whatever, and uh, rides and takes classes and has worked there. But she loves plants. So we take Bailey to the plant show. I said, okay, honey, I'll, you know, I'll buy you a plant. Some of these plants are right pricey. And she had, she had cash with her, and she bought one. And says, she picked up the most expensive one and said, hey, Poppy, would you buy this one? Oh, what's a poppy to do? You buy a plant. I said, Bailey, that carnivorous plant, that Venus flytrap, looks a little sick. It doesn't look very healthy. I want to restore it. She takes the ones she can get free or talk down that look like they're going to die. And she takes them home. And she nurtures them, fertilizes them, talks to them, makes sure they have enough light, enough moisture, reads all about them on the internet, and brings them back to life. You see, the word revive means to help me come back to life. It, 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 it's been said it means to help me flower again, help me bloom again, restore me. It's not an easy process. And sometimes as you think about it, as you get older, and maybe you've, your faith has withered a little bit, you're tired, you don't know what to do, you're a little discouraged, it gets that way, doesn't it? Let's be honest. I've heard, you know, I've talked to people, says, you know, I'm really struggling in my faith. I've, I've had that deep struggle. I, I don't know what I believe anymore. It's hard. It's hard. Well, you know, this restoration business is driving me nuts. I'm seeing it everywhere I go. So, hard times wear us down. And there, there are four places I've seen where this is true in our society, and especially on Netflix. Anybody watch Netflix? You know, it's out there. Pandemic issues that continue to linger. You know, it's a, it's a big time issue. Long COVID that just won't go away. Whether it's the aches and pains or the nerve damage. My ENT, and we went over my hearing because my hearing got worse after COVID and, you know, continues to get worse. And somehow the virus affects the nerves in your, in your brain. Don't know how. But it also leaves you in a fog. It leaves you uncertain about a lot of things and you forget a lot of stuff. So COVID is structuring, is still out there. Well, if you watch Netflix, there's a couple of documentaries. One of them is Linux Hill. Anybody watch Linux Hill? Not, no. You don't, watch, you don't watch Netflix much, do you? You've got to be old and like some of this stuff. But it's a documentary about neurosurgeons in New York. And uh, the first one, Linux, Linux Hill, is uh, prior to the pandemic and the struggles they're having dealing with brain tumors and cancer and all this kind of stuff, and the struggles they go through, up and down emotionally, physically, how it wears them out. And our healthcare professionals in our communities, we've seen doctors quit, nurses quit, we've, we've seen people that are just burned out. Well, the second documentary is Emergency NYC, which looks at those doctors post-pandemic, what they have gone through after it's gotten better, and they tell their stories. 
Well, we have all stories to tell, too. It's uh, facing death and uncertainty, facing job pressures, all those things that go with it. Well, the second thing on my list was economy and work-life balances. You know, you hear a lot of stuff on the news about people that are resigning, the great resignation. I've had it up to here with my job, and I quit. I'm tired, right? I'm, re I'm not going to do this anymore. I don't like my job. Work-life balance. It says I want to spend more time with my family. That's very understandable. But I'm having to work two or three jobs to pay the bills. Ever been there? Yeah, I have. Not easy, is it? But you got to do what you got to do to take care of your family, even when it's hard. Even when it's hard. So we've got that to deal with. And so uh, the economy's not real great. Price of eggs is still up and down. Price of milk, up. Price of bread, up. It costs more to go to the grocery store. It costs more to do anything. If you're going to buy a new car, it costs a lot more. You know, so these are things we, we, we struggle with in our society. Does that weigh on our faith sometimes? You betcha it does. Then what about war, crime, and policing in our cities? 323 mass shootings in our country since the first of the year. Over 20,000 people have died from gunshot wounds this year alone. Leads me to the next one, mental health crises. And I'm looking over here because my daughter's a teacher and she tells me my students are afraid. They're dealing with depression because their world means it's dangerous for them to go to school because of school shootings. Mass shootings. Things that were fun become dangerous. Things that we used to do all the time and didn't think anything about are now really scary. When we have uh, young people walking the streets at night with automatic weapons, that's real scary. So with all of this stuff going on, what do we do? The psalmist solves that for us. He said, I've seen all the bad stuff going on. I've seen how the wicked go through life and things don't happen to them necessarily. Help me, Father. Help me rebuild my life. I don't have an answer. I don't have one answer. I think it's more complex than we make it out to be. At one time, I would just say, oh, you know, you're suffering from depression. Let's pray about it. You may be able to lift your depression. It's more complicated than that, isn't it? Things going on in your life that you have no control over, and you just feel down. You feel way down. What do you need? Well, I've thought about it. We need help. Help comes from the Lord and counseling, therapy, medication. So find out who your counselor is. What do they believe in? You know, Christian Family Services, counseling here in our building. And there, more and more of their services to the community are counseling-based just for these reasons. You need somebody to talk to. You need somebody to open your heart up to. Somebody that will help bear your burden. Make sure it's a Christian counselor. I worked on a master's degree in counseling a number of decades ago. And there were so many different counseling theories, counseling modalities. What type of counseling are you going in for? Satyrian? 
or others that are cognitive therapy, reality therapy. There's all kinds of counseling methods out there, and it depends on what you ascribe to. I, I dropped out of that counseling program. I was taking marital counseling uh, program, help, uh, help married couples and how to solve issues, and had a huge difference with the dean of the department. He was a Lipscomb graduate, had been a campus minister as well, but he'd been married and divorced three times. And so you're telling me my thoughts about how to have a solid marriage aren't going to work? Has it worked for you? He says, well, I don't think you're going to make it in our program. He says, I don't want to be in your program. Went to Harding and took Christian counseling there under Jerry Jones. We had a seminar Mary Dell and I went to. Took other classes at SLU. And there are people out there that share our values. Make sure you find somebody that share our values. Counseling is important. You may need medication. There are just some things going on in your brain you're not aware of and the chemistry of your brain, the neuro, neurotransmitters and all the things that make us who we are, you may need some help. If you had an infection, would you take an antibiotic? Yeah. If you needed chemotherapy, would you take it? Yeah. But if you're having an emotional health crisis, would you get that help? Yeah. But that's only one thing. One of the courses I took was a friendship counseling been shown that one of the most important things in our life are the friends we have. The people that we can share life with, that will lift us up when we're down, that will push us out when we need to go forward, who will show us your word, who will eat with you, talk with you, hold you when you need to be held, hug you when you need a hug, laugh with you when you need a laugh. Find good friends. And then just number three. And remember, this is just what works for me. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. When you see your children going through this, when you see a grandchild struggling in the depths of depression and anxiety, you need that. You need the words of, of Jesus in your heart that helps you make it through and not give up. Keep on loving like God loves. Keep on loving when they're unlovable. Keep on loving when they're hard to get along with and they just don't know their way. Don't give up. Don't give up. And we're talking about faith on Sunday morning and Shane's done a good job going through the book of James, which is about faith. And we talk through three different kinds of faith. There's Bad faith, no works. The demons have faith, they have faith, but to, you know they don't do anything about it. They believe, and then there's living and loving faith that we do the good works. You know we're called to to have that kind of faith. Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 11 what that faith is. It's the the hope we have when there is no hope. It is the, the good things that we can't see that we know that are real, that we believe. Yesterday at the pen show, or Friday at the pen show when Scott and I went, I met a man there that knew my brother who worked at the Corvette plant in Bowling Green, Kentucky. He's a professional engineer like, like Scott, and, and even Carl's been went yesterday to the pen show, so engineers show up for pen shows. But Larry had a different table this year. 
He had his pens and his pen parts, and he repairs them for people. There was a stack of books there that Larry had written that were about origins and Christian evidences and, and all the, you know, how to apply that to your friends and neighbors. So Larry reached out and, and, and to his neighbors and he had a friend that was an atheist and he wrote a whole book. I said, would you, and took it to him and asked him, would you look at my book for me? And the neighbor read it and the neighbor became a believer. His mission was to, to know the evidences and share the evidences to help others come to faith. That Hebrews 11. And uh, it built me up. We worked with my brother. My brother died from cancer. About my age when he died. Lung cancer, as did my dad. He said, your brother was a good man. I needed that. I needed that. I bought a book and he gave me a book. Friendships like that, you can't buy. Moments like that, you have to relish. So building that faith, Hebrews 11, I have a strategy. And in 2 Peter chapter 1, 5-11, through 11, you've heard me use it time and time and time again. Add to your faith. Add to your faith. Shane's preaching, faith works. I add this, work your faith. Grow it. And be armored. Put on the whole armor of God. The knowledge, the sword, the truth, the spirit. You've got to do all of it. This doesn't happen by accident. It's got to be real. Somebody used to tell me they could preach a, a sermon on a cereal box. Well, here's your sermon wrapped up in an ink pen. This is valuable. I can take notes with it. I can write a sermon, five minutes sitting in the back row. <laughs> you know, find out what I do on Sunday morning. But, you know, it's useful. You know, people are going to classes to learn how to write now, how to, how to use it for calligraphy, cursive writing, because it's good for your brain. And what's good for your brain should be good for your heart, should be good for your faith. But if I don't use this ink pen, if I let it set, it dries out. The ink becomes hard. It won't flow. It's useless. It's useless. And somewhere, somebody will say, no, it doesn't work, and it'll go in a trash can, or it'll go into a yard sale. But like this ink pen, I clean it, I fill it, and I use it. My prayer for you is this morning that you will be filled with the Holy Spirit and the love of God that knows no bounds. God walks with us. He sent us his Holy Spirit to be the comforter to be right along beside us in this journey we make to eternity. And it's just in, in this moment in your life and in mine that he's calling us to come home. When I was a teenager, I was taken to a lot of revivals. One of them was with my coach in track and cross country. He was a very religious man. And he would take a lot of boys uh, from our, our, our track club 
to different revivals. My aunt would take me to her church for revivals. They were all working on me. Lady that helped my mother preached revivals in the Evergreen Baptist Church. She had preached to me too during the week at home, trying to revive me. Mr. Burning, you know this is what you want to do. Don't beat your brother up. This morning, need a little revival? Come on, as together we stand and sing.